Welcome, happy people, and everyone on the interwebs around the world. You have landed here on the Utah Stories podcast, Hidden Utah podcast. Warning, if you are a tribal partisan, I need to recommend that you stop listening or watching. If you love living in an echo chamber where you have your confirmation of your own opinions reflected back to you, this is not for you. You are about to enter the danger zone. There's plenty of tribal politics, partisan podcasts out there for you that will support your judgments, your intersectionality, your wokeness and opinions, no matter how off base they might be. But if you don't want to live in a bubble, if you want honest, truthful journalism that attempts to find answers to very difficult questions and issues in our society, in our cities, in our state, please join me. I'm feeling like I'm standing at the Grand Canyon of political chasms right now. I see two completely different universes evolving before my eyes. So on the left, we're told we live in the most tumultuous of an awful of times. We need to get this fascist dictator Trump out of power before he destroys our world and the lives we know. They espouse that we must stop climate change in the next 10 years before it destroys our planet. Furthermore, we must stop uh, with violence if needed. The rising tide of white supremacists led by Trump who want to suppress and repress racial and ethnic minorities. Furthermore, must, we, must, we must be willing to take down institutions that are systemically racist and reform our country, uprooted if needed, so the power returns into the hands of the people, somehow via the government. Um, on the right of the chasm, there is a completely different universe. In this universe, the main agenda item is to prevent socialist Marxist agendas from moving forward where Antifa and the burning and looting of our cities needs to end before we have a complete anarchy. We need to return law and order, continue to build the wall, protect our country, be careful who, who we let in. We need to protect our Second Amendment, and currently our entire Constitution is at risk of being torn to shreds. But like the left, the right believes the right situation right now is more dire than ever. Because if we don't stop the leftists, we could literally be facing rioting, looting mobs who want to take our property, burn our flag, destroy our founding documents and principles. So hysteria, hysteria, and we are leading to this election day, which these two forces are coming together and they're both both saying they're not going to recognize the results of the election if it's close. So um, my point is, on this podcast, obviously the po the two parties have never been so far apart. And if you don't if you don't find yourself firmly encamped right now, you're looking at this chasm and you're just seeing that it feels like the S word is about to hit the fan. Um, I don't want to sound hysterical or alarmist, and I've I've literally just turned off the TV for the last three months. I just found myself um, it, that it was unre completely unrepresentative of what was actually happening around me. Like I didn't want to feel extremely afraid of coronavirus. I didn't want to feel like I shouldn't be happy because it's a beautiful day outside and I'm running with my dogs and I should instead, you know, feel oppressed or, you know, according to one side or fearful or anything like that. So I just turned off the TV and I found myself feeling so much happier and healthier. Like I I don't have headaches. I, I just feel like this idea that we need to pay attention to what they're saying, the media is saying, uh, I don't think we need to do that, actually. I think we need to find the truth. And so that's why I gave that disclaimer at the beginning of the podcast. Um, still, so I feel like we need to attempt to understand what's this chasm all about, why it's formed, how it's formed, and um, more a little bit on the Black Lives Matter mu movement as the podcast. But I found a really great documentary I really highly want to recommend to everyone who wants to understand why we are more divided than as a country than ever and how this happened. It's called The Social Dilemma. So former employees of Facebook explain how and why the algorithm of Facebook and Twitter platforms essentially 
firmly place everyone into their own echo chambers. Like they want to feed you exactly the type of vitriol, anger, emotion building type tweets or Facebook posts that are going to keep you on the platform. We had a podcast guest, uh, Pete Ashdown from X Mission, talk about this about a year ago. And it's absolutely true. It's like they don't want to tell you the nuance of the argument you're looking at. They don't want to feed to you, well, you might consider, you know, the other point of view. No, they're just going to feed you all of the most hysterical, uh, you know, opinion regurgitating, uh, unuseful information to support one side or the other side because they've created a filter bubble, they call it, around you as a user of Facebook or Twitter. And so... Social commentator, podcaster Sam Harris describes it as, now most people are literally living in a sea of disinformation. Sam Harris is a man on the left who recognizes that the the major narratives coming out of the newspapers, a lot of them are just simply false or promoting things that are mostly false. Um, I want to give you a couple of examples on both sides. So during the, the one and only looks like presidential debate, Joe Biden said, a white supremacist came and shot protesters in Kenosha. That has been the headline. White supremacist shot and killed BLM protesters. The story says that 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse fatally shot two pro- protesters in Kenosha during a peaceful protest for James Blake. Now the facts. Kyle Rittenhouse, he did kill two people, but these people were grabbing his gun. Was it smart of Kyle Rittenhouse to take an AR-15 to a to a protest? No, that was about as dumb as you could possibly be uh, as a as a kid with a gun. Why did he go to the protest? He was going to basically say he wanted to protect local businesses against rioting and looting. Um, he. What doesn't have any, Rittenhouse has zero ties to white supremacist organizations. There's nothing that comes close to indicating that he had any ties to white supremacist organizations. He was a white guy with a gun, and for that reason, they're calling him a white supremacist. But the media lies and fake news is real. So CNN, the New York Times, and the DNC found it extremely useful fodder to support their ongoing narrative that there is a racial and violent uprising of white supremacists who are killing people in riots. This is completely false. There is not a big uprising of white supremacists happening. White supremacists live. They do terrible things. They're terrible people. They're terrible organizations. But they are not the ones doing primarily doing the burning and the looting of cities. So to complete their narrative, they want to say Donald Trump is driving white supremacist groups. This is not true. There's a group called the Proud Boys. Um, Gavin McGinnis, uh, who was a founder of Vice News, a left-leaning news organization, he started the Proud Boys. And the current leader of the Proud Boys, his name is Enrico Tario. He's a black Afro-Cuban, and he has he's quoted saying they have long-standing, long-standing regulations prohibiting racist, white supremacists, or violent activity. If you don't believe me, I'm absolutely fine if you don't believe me, but go do your own research. The Proud Boys is not a white supremacist organization. They're a pretty big movement. They're trying to counterbalance the Antifa movement because they feel that the Antifa movement isn't getting uh, recognized as they should be and that there needs to be a counterbalance. That's really what they're about. And uh, a bunch of tough guys, uh, but they're not white supremacists. A lot of brown, black people are part of the Proud Boys. But disinformation runs rampant, just like when I attended. I attended just about uh, three years ago a rally at the U of U campus that got so crazy um, I was just blown away. Um, Black Lives Matter showed up. Um, a group of maybe Proud Boys, they were basically uh, Trump supporters, showed up. I talked to them. I'd made a whole video about it. 
but they were claiming, the, these, these group of protesters were claiming that Ben Shapiro was a white supremacist. Ben Shapiro is an Orthodox Jew. He was a target, the, the, the biggest target of white supremacist organizations in the year 2015. He was getting all this hate mail from white supremacist organizations. He's not a white supremacist, and that was their major claim as to why they wanted to shut him down from speaking on campus. Um, and now I want to show you uh, a clip from that protest that I think sums up the whole problem with what Black Lives Matter is and all the white people in Utah who are joining Black Lives Matter. So let's show that clip now. Okay, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. You see that girl, the blonde girl, who is moving her herself over into the face of the white man with the goatee. So she has decided, I don't know how, but she's decided that this counter-protester must be a white supremacist, and she is there on behalf of black people to push him out and get him get rid of him. She's angry, very, very angry, as you can see. That guy, play the clip again. Look what his mouth is saying. I never said that black lives don't matter. That's what he's saying. I never said they don't matter. He's there because he's basically a Trump supporter, and he's trying to support the idea that free speech should should exist. A lot of the a lot of the supporters I talked to just said, "Here is a guy." A lot of people might disagree with Ben Shapiro. They are strong First Amendment supporters. I don't see any reason we should ever be shutting down anybody from speaking, even white supremacists. Say a white supremacist actually did want to speak on campus. Let them speak. Let's hear what they have to say. Then let's counter their arguments with better arguments that, they're, that white supremacy doesn't make any sense. Um, this was this was ridiculous. These videos actually got more uh, v views on YouTube. I think it's up to like three or four hundred thousand views. Uh, if you can s watch the whole video, you kind of get in a sense of a lot of these people just have no clue what they're protesting, and and they're really becoming like useful idiots, like pawns for a group and a movement much bigger than they are. This is what actually scares me. If a lot of people just become misinformed or disinformed. We could have bands of marauding idiots out there fighting each other over things they just simply don't understand. And my call to action here on the program today is go and do your own research. Get out of the partisan politics. Try to nail down facts and truth for yourself. Um, so, on the other side of the aisle, obviously, Donald Trump has a very loose relationship with the truth. He is out to get things done. He's out to uh, push his side and his uh, agenda. And whether you like his agenda or not, his brashness, his Twitter feed, um, what he does is very uh, irreverent. It's not presidential. Um, a lot of people want to call him um, a fascist dictator. So that's, that's what I have a problem with. What is fascism? A lot of people need to go look that up. What is fascism? And all these people calling Donald Trump a fascist. There is nobody in their right mind who knows what that word means who would call Donald Trump a fascist. It's out of ignorance that people are calling him a fascist. So I want to show you a clip from Dinesh D'Souza on this topic. I've never heard a better explanation that he recently gave. This idea that Trump is a fascist is, of course, a pretty widespread belief on the left. So let's examine it for a minute. Fact number one, all the founders of fascism in every major country were leftists. This was true of England and France and Italy and Germany and Belgium and Spain. In France, for example, the founders of fascism, Marcel Die, uh, a leftist, 
Jean Aleman, the grandfather of French socialism in England, Oswald Mosley, who was on the left wing, the far left wing of the British Labour Party, Mussolini, the founder of fascism in Italy, was a Marxist, and later when Mussolini was in Salo, his chief advisor, Nicola Bombacci, was the founder of the Italian Communist Party and a pretty good friend of Lenin. Number two, um, Mussolini said in defining fascism, everything in the state, nothing outside the state. And here you get the idea of what fascism is. It's state control. You can confirm this, by the way, whip out your phone, take a minute, just Google the Nazi 20 point platform. Nazi socialism wasn't just a matter of what's in the name, National Socialism. It's the actual platform that got the Nazis to become the largest party in Germany. And look right down the list, state control of the banks, state control of healthcare, state control of education, state control of uh, the churches. This does not sound like anything that Trump believes, but it does sound an awful lot. It does resemble what Elizabeth Warren believes and Kamala Harris and Bernie Sanders. So there's a long history of fascists. They all come from the left. They all want more government power. They want to control the means of production. They've Mussolini, Hitler. They all came from socialist Marxist ideas. There's never been a small government um, fascist, not the Trump is a small government type person, but he's not calling for uh, let's let's uh, grow the size of government and take over the free market economy. Every fascist that ever existed said, we're going to take over sectors of the economy and we're going to incorporate that into the government and hopefully make and redistribute wealth. That's not Trump's ideology. He's a capitalist. He believes in, in free market capitalism, but he is not a fascist. So I've been looking at the Green New Deal. I talked about the Green New Deal in the previous episode. The Green New Deal is this idea that we're just going to take all the spigots we've got out there, the all the petroleum um, uh, pumping we're doing, all the fracking, all of the anything that's producing um, CO2 emissions, and we're just going to turn it off in the next five to 10 years. We're just gonna remove ourselves from fossil fuels and then we'll all save ourselves from global warming. That's the premise of the Green New Deal and more and more, it, it came from the far left, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez is a strong proponent of it. Bernie Sanders was a proponent of it. Now the Biden camp is talking about um, adopting a lot of the, the uh, components of it. There has never been government intervention in, in stopping an entire sector of the economy from producing its good where it's been successful. There is no way the Green New Deal will be a success under what they're proposing. It would simply remove a massive amount of our economy and our economic framework and it would make us all much more poor. The thing that will actually make our climate, save our climate and actually help uh, mitigate the, the effects of global warming or um, terrible emissions that we have is technology and jobs in technology and what, as I said before, Tesla is doing. Um, the Green New Deal is a fascist idea. It is nothing less than saying, we're going to take this sector of the economy, we're going to wrap our government mandates around it, we're going to prevent it from producing its product, and we're going to take control over the energy sector of our economy. That is fascist. That is nothing less than that. And anybody who's in part of Antifa, if you want to be truly anti-fascist, then be anti-Green New Deal. Um, so my main point of this podcast is Stop trusting the news media. Stop trusting Facebook rants and your friends on Facebook. It's time we stop listening to everything that we're being fed online and start researching our own facts. Find actual primary sources. Cross-check your facts before you make assumptions and draw conclusions. Don't go to 
a rally or a demonstration, as fun as it may sound, until you know what it actually stands for, until you know the facts of the case. So the Black Lives Matter movement is really at the center of this movement to use the ignorance of their followers to promote agenda, an agenda that has nothing to do with what they're espousing. So I had a back and forth email with somebody who watched the uh, Black Lives Matter um, discussion I had with Lex Scott, the president of Utah's Black Lives Matter chapter. I found I agreed with her on everything she had to say. All of the police reform things she wanted to do, 100% I agreed with because it was all about reforming our police department and our criminal justice system. I don't know why we're fighting a war on drugs still. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense that so many um, black people are incarcerated for possession charges. That doesn't make sense. And there's there should not be qualified immunity for all police officers. Police officers have to be accountable. So I didn't go into the broader organization of Black Lives Matter. I wanted to know what do you want to see happen? But how does the Utah chapter of Black Lives Matter divorce itself from the international, global Black Lives Matter organization? I don't think it does. The international, global Black Lives Matter movement wants to see um, elimination of the nuclear family and the idea of a nuclear family. They want to promote the ideas that capitalism needs to be completely reformatted. They, um, they have goals that are way beyond criminal justice reform that I completely disagree with. And I can't, I can't imagine that the local chapter, our Utah chapter of the Black Lives Matter movement can just say, no, we just want criminal justice reform in Salt Lake City. So New York City's Black Lives chapter actually dissolved away from the national global Black Lives Matter movement. I don't know the details of why they did that, but I, I think if, if Lex Scott, who has a lot of great ideas, really wants to legitimize her ideas, she needs to take a stand and say that the Black Lives Matter in Utah will not be about eliminating the nuclear family, will not be about uprooting capitalism, producing Marxist ideas, and introducing new Marxist ideas. I really don't want to see Black Lives Matter all over the country with these strong local chapters then take their strength and use it to basically ruin America. And that's that's what I fear. And I had a back and forth with a guy in an email exchange. I'm going to post that on our website. You can read it, which made me think I probably should research the national global Black Lives Matter movement uh, to a greater extent. Um, but I, I can recommend highly, um, I, I listen to a lot of really great podcasts about this, but I recently heard a podcast uh, of Sam of Sam Harris. He had on his show John McWhorter from Columbia University, who's a professor of critical who's critical of the anti-racist theories and the entire anti-racist movement. Um and he he's a uh African American professor at Columbia. He's coming out with a book very soon. Um go check out that podcast. I think it's excellent. So and I mentioned it in my talk with Lex that I met a bunch of black guys from Africa who helped me find my keys in the park. Um, it was amazing how nice these guys were, especially the main guy who helped me. He was, a, and he was actually a, you know, a black dude from Saudi Arabia and he was living here and he felt so lucky to be here. He felt so lucky to be a software engineer in Utah and he loved this place. He came from Ohio actually before he lived in Saudi Arabia um, but the thing about it is like, if you hang out with immigrants, they are all so happy to be here. They feel like they've won a lottery. They feel like, man, we are in the greatest place on earth to enjoy basically becoming everything we couldn't be where we came from. And I'm like looking at these guys who helped me in the park and I'm like, they're everything I would love to see 
all ethnic minorities be? And I have a lot of immigrant friends. My wife is an immigrant from Bosnia. She came here because she was able to study, and she was able to get her PhD in physics. She used the systems that are in place here to get a doctorate degree. We eventually went to Cambridge University for a year where she did postdoctorate work. She got as high up as you could get in, in the physics world, taking advantage of the freedoms that exist here in the United States, the only country in the world that you have so many, so many opportunities available to you. Why don't Black Lives Matter want to look at the country in that way? Why do they want to um, why do they want to endorse and and basically promote this theory of racist oppression? that all black people should still be feeling. That's a story that that is has run its course. I feel like there's never been a better time in history for black people to live. There's less racism today, certainly, than there's ever been before in the entire history of the world. So I wanted to try to see if there was anybody out here, out there that that might agree with me and I found a really interesting clip. Um, the, it's two Ivy League professors talking about Black Lives Matter. They're both uh, professors. Um, their names are Glenn Lowry, who teaches economics at Brown University. And the other, again, is John McWhorter, who teaches linguistics and philosophy at Columbia University, two of the most prestigious universities in the, in the United States, talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. Here's what they had to say. Our story is more than a story of surviving domination and oppression. Our story is an American story, not only because, or even mainly, because our ancestors were slaves. And you could go on in this vein. The emancipation is a part of that story. And the, and the emancipation is not merely the grudging recognition of African-American humanity. It's the culmination of a certain kind of political dynamic that begins in the middle of the 18th century and actually does extirpate slavery that's a world historic achievement man i don't get it who can do it what society what democracy what political tradition what nation has done it mm -hmm. i mean you have a, you're hard pressed to, to to give any parallel anyway i'll stop i know i'm going on the uh, african-american story is the american story the american story is the african-american story yes some of my ancestors were slaves they weren't only slaves and those weren't all of my ancestors so not every story is a story of domination and oppression. Our American story is much more than that. So I challenge people who are out there feeling their white privilege and their white guilt to go find another story. Seriously, you don't want to be a pawn for this unhappy, illogical, irrational story. Or perhaps you could realize that America is especially great when you take away the intersectionality. I'll tell you what I mean by that. To call yourself something American, it really degrades the American part of it. So if I called myself an Armenian American, okay, maybe that would celebrate my cultural heritage, but that doesn't celebrate what my ancestors wanted when they came here. My wife would be a Bosnian American. Why don't we all just be Americans? Why can't we all be Americans? So when my ancestors came here, they never taught their kids their mother tongue. My, my great-grandma and my great-grandfather both spoke Armenian. They never spoke English very well, but they never taught their kids, you got to learn Armenian customs, traditions, history, culture, the language. They said, you are now Americans. Enjoy it. They didn't talk much about Turkey or Armenia because they were proud to be Americans. America is the greatest melting pot and the greatest experiment, experiment ever into allowing individuals to realize their potential. So nobody should feel guilty for being white unless you personally did something terrible to black people because of your whiteness. And who is really out there doing anything because of their feelings of white supremacy? There are people, there are racists. It's, it's a truly something that exists still in our country. But why should we, as a people, feel sorry because we perhaps were oppressed or our ancestors were oppressed 
do black people really want me to feel sorry for them and want my pity? Um, I found another clip from the same guys talking along those same lines. But a lot of people are just going to walk around with their brows knit. And so it's all about this hideous history and anybody walking around now is complicit in it unless we d devote our lives to decrying it and blowing up American society and starting again in some way that's never specified. But the thing is, don't these people realize that if you spend your life approaching history like that, then the white man wins. You know, basically, a lot of these people seem to think they're going to live 500 years. You're going to spend from when you're about 19 until you're about 79 with your brow knit, angry, dealing with this cartoon version of history out of some sense of duty. And that's all you're going to do instead of being interested in other things, instead of embracing the real thing. I wonder sometimes if some of these people know the joy, and I've said this on the show before, but do they know the joy of finding out new things? Do they know the joy of being interested in anything? And if they don't, with a lot of them, I wonder, what are you doing in academia? Or frankly, what are you doing highly placed in journalism if nothing interests you for its own sake and all you have is this glum, oversimplifying mission? It's a kind of mind that I pity in a way. Okay, so go, going back to my own ancestry, my Armenian ancestors were were completely oppressed under the uh, at the very end of uh, the the Ottoman Empire when the uh, Turk the Turks were basically slaughtering Armenians. They the entire side of my grandmother's family was slaughtered. She only escaped because she was left for dead in a death march at age twelve. She was then put in a in an orphanage in Cyprus in Greece, and she found her brother who had taken off before the whole war started. And she came to America because he uh, he actually, um, she knew he was in America and she tracked him down. And so at age 15, she came across, and I want to show this bill of lading, this thing I keep up on my wall at all times. This is the receipt for my grandmother's passage across the Atlantic that got her her freedom um, and sent her to Utah, where she married my grandfather, who she was just 15, and he was um, in his late 30s. They had seven kids together. They built this big family, and that's the story, the story of what happened after the oppression, the slaughter that I want to enjoy. I could, if I really wanted to be a victim, say Turks should pay reparations for what they did to Armenians, but I just feel lucky to be here. I mean, I would rather, much rather live here in Utah than back in Turkey or Armenia. So why should I, um, why should I look at what they did as evil, which turned out good for me as something bad that happened? I mean, that's, that's a theme of the, of the Old Testament. What man might intend for evil, God often intends for good. So my message here is go find a story in your own life, a narrative that's positive, that helps you realize your own intrinsic value, not a story of victimhood, not a story of I'm so oppressed, I'm such a... I, I, my ancestors suffered so many years to bring me here to this point. My guess is you've never had it better, nor anybody in your family genealogy, than you have it right now. And so that's, that's the conclusion of this podcast. I thank you so much for watching. If you like this podcast, please give it a thumbs up. And uh, please subscribe to Utah Stories on our website. That's really the only way this content gets out. We don't cater to social media much anymore. Uh, we do have an Instagram account, a Facebook account. We're finding they're blocking us. I don't know why. They don't want us to promote our content anymore. Um, so go to utahstories.com. Subscribe to our digital newsletter. That's the best way to get our new content. And uh, this program is produced by Connie Lewis. Our technical producer is Tyler Bond. Our digital publisher is Golda hukic Markosian. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time. The Utah Stories Show is brought to you by Canyon Meadows Grass-Fed Beef. 
If you have not tried pasture-raised beef, you need to try Canyon Meadows. So I used to sell meat door-to-door for Tyson Foods. That was the first job I had out of high school. And I sold these vacuum-sealed packages of meat. And I had no clue how the meat was raised or what was in the packages, what chemicals were in there. And I learned that most of this meat came from old dairy cows. And they put chemical tenderizer in it to uh, make it taste better. But you'd always, I, I mean, I ate a lot of this meat. I'd always get this like rot gut feeling after I ate it. I didn't discover pasture-raised beef until like 20 years later. And you never get that feeling. You never get this like weird, gross feeling after you eat it. It feels great to eat it. Canyon Meadows grass-fed beef is the very best grass-fed beef producer in Utah. I visited their ranch. I did a documentary about their ranch. They are truly awesome family, uh, third-generation family farm in beautiful Altamont. Go try the difference. Go taste the difference for yourself. We have a very special offer code. Go use Utah Stories when you buy your first package of meat from them. We have a freezer absolutely full of their their meat right now we buy a half a cow at a time it's really the best way to buy meat it's good for you it's good for the earth and it has delicious flavor cmrbeef.com go visit them right now the utah story show is also brought to you by green bike salt lake city's nonprofit bike share connects employment and residential centers to transit stops and popular entertainment destinations Green Bike seeks to improve community health, air quality, and increase the use of existing transit infrastructure. Green Bike is a local nonprofit, public-private partnership between Salt Lake City, the Utah Transit Authority, Select Health, and other private sponsors. To date, Green Bikers have removed 5.8 million vehicles from local roads, preventing more than 5 million pounds of CO2 from entering our air all while burning 76 million calories in the process. That's 267,000 slices of pizza. To learn more about Green Bike, go visit them at greenbikeslc.org. You can subscribe to their bikes for less than 20 cents a day. And the cool thing about it is you just get on at one station, you get off at the other station, you lock up the bike, you forget about the bike, I've had so many bikes stolen in my life. I've had five stolen out of my garage. I had three, two stolen from downtown Salt Lake City. You never have to worry about your bike being stolen again. Go check them out. They're a really great company and uh, highly recommend them. All right. Also want to tell everybody about our new issue of Utah Stories Magazine. This is uh, our magazine for this month. It's October. The main story is um, uprooted. So these giant trees fell over all over downtown Salt Lake City, mostly in the parks, massive cottonwoods um, because a hurricane, you know, blew through. We had 100 mile per hour winds and uh, we got an amazing group of photographs that we took um, out going around. We got stories about COVID in the classroom. Um, We've got stories about how haunted houses are surviving we've got a story about something called smash labs where you can go to a rage room and go smash up all this stuff uh we got a story about hobbitville there uh, the city bought out this this place that was going to be developed and they're going to turn it into a park we've got everything that's going to happen with that uh, in sugar house um gentrification of moab you've probably heard of moab if you're watching this it's become this incredible destination for thousands of people they're growing it extremely fast we've got some of the best food trucks you can visit in utah a write-up on a lot of these amazing food truckers Um, patio dining we got outdoor concerts going on entrepreneur stories just a lot of really awesome content i'm super happy with this issue you can pick it up at all associated food stores along the wasatch front uh, for a complete list Uh, visit utahstories.com. We'll post a list there for you. It's basically the uh, Dan's and Macy's um, and Dick's. I believe that's it. 
but just a lot all, all over the Wasatch Front. This the magazine's doing incredibly well in those stores. Plus, we have 650 other locations you can pick this magazine up. It's all about supporting local business. Local businesses have been destroyed, as we know, due to COVID, and now more than ever, we need to buy local.